This sermon is brought to you by Shofar Christian Church. We hope that you will be blessed by this message. Our audio and video sermons are also available on Shofar TV to download and share. You Good morning, Church. Good morning. My name is Marvin. Um, I will share a bit this morning about who I am because I understand that most of you may not know me at all. Um, so I just want to definitely share the word this morning. And it's, it's quite a very powerful thing in the heart that I'm going to share. As Henny mentioned, we are doing a series called Walking With Them. And this morning I really want to talk about living by the word of God, not by emotions. And the title for this morning is it up? Maybe can you see it? It's called the Holy Place. And it's very powerful for us, powerful for us to understand what the Holy Place actually is. And before we get into that, into the temple, what that means and signifies for you, I wanted to share the fundamental scripture that's going to underpin today's preach. And that's Hebrews 4.12. It says this. For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Beautiful picture we see there. Soul and spirit, joints and marrow. You might not know this, but I used to love touch rugby. Like, I loved it. My knees, on the other hand, did not like touch rugby. Today, I've had about five knee surgeries on my knee. Right? Fortunately, none of the last 10 years, you can tell, probably. Because I haven't been doing as much touch rugby as I used to. But one of the things that I tore was my ACL. And that's your anterior cruciate ligament. It's quite an important one. It runs and joins the two legs together. And so I've had about three of those replaced. What they do is they actually put a donor ligament into your knee and allow your body to regrow on that donor ligament. And I'm like, what? I'm getting a transplant. They're like, no, it's actually not a transplant. You don't need to take anti-rejection medication. It's completely denatured. It's in fact got no life. So you don't need to take anything. You're not going to get someone else's body's memories coming to you or anything like that. It's just the ligament structure. And so in a sense, this thing often no life. It's just a joint. They put it in and then what happens? Your body takes off. It gives life to this joint and it becomes strength. And fortunately enough, my knee today is not as strong as ever, but I can still walk. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> now narrow, the two contrasting pictures that he gives. You might not know this, but marrow is actually the most significant part of your body. Who knows what manner marrow actually does to your body? Just raise your hand very into one. No one? One? Some biologists in the house. That's good. Marrow is significant and it's actually the factory that makes blood within your body. I don't know if there's a scripture that's next after that. No, no, not that one. I didn't actually put it up. Go back one minute. It says in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of a creature is in the blood. So here you have this joint, which actually offers zero life, in fact it needs life. It's a life receiver. And here you have this thing called marrow, which you can't live without. It is your body's life given. How beautiful is that picture? Now when we mirror that up there, it says soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It means there's a division in yourself that is either going to need life, and it's going to be a life. And notice which is there. The soul is something that cannot give life. We're sick with enough, so we're going to talk a little bit about the soul. But the soul is something that cannot give life. But the spirit, that gives you life. You guys tracking with me? And what can divide between those two things? The word of God. Woo! And I'm just preaching. I love it. <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And the way we can understand that a little bit more is we need to understand where the heart fits in, right? Because that's where the Word of God is really working. It's the thought discerner of your heart. We need to understand where that sits and the soul and the spirit. 
And where that sits. Everyone say I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah, just to make sure you don't want to call me sleep yet. I know that a lot of people are out in George Cooney. Okay. Uh, 56 kilometer. I really thank the Lord that I had five knee surgeries to say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> the next slide, please. It says here in 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? That scripture makes some pretty exciting revelations because then the Old Testament talking about the temple becomes pretty significant for me and for you. Because that means the temple of God, God has placed everything within that temple, not without purpose. It has got beautiful purpose and significance for me and you. I want to explore a bit of that this morning. Everyone say I'm ready. Ready. Okay, cool. So, this is pretty much two aspects of the temple. I know if you've got it on your phone, you can probably see it a lot clearer. But the one on the left, all right, you see this almost a centralized rectangle that's there? That's the internal workings of the temple. The very top, you'll see there, on the right hand side, is actually called the holiest of holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant sits. Is that the temple armies within it? And it's where the presence of God would reside in the temple. Between the holiest of holies and the next place, which is the little place below it, that's called the holy place. The holy place had three furnishings in it. We'll talk a bit more about that. But between the holiest of holies and the holiest place, it was actually a veil. Not like a bridal wedding veil. You're talking a six inch thick veil that contained the Spirit of God and the holiest of is this thing was significant. You move further out and you get to the porch. Not that they're significant for today's preach, but that porch is essentially the gateway into the temple. Inside, just outside the, the temple itself, you have what's called the inner court. And the inner court had aspects of where they would do sacrifice and washing and cleansing. And then outside the airport would be confirmed, team confirmed the outer court. Now, if you have it on your phone, you can probably see a bit more things there. This has a significance of what this is for you spiritually. If we look at the temple, you can contrast it on the left here. The holiest of holies actually represents your new spirit as a born again believer. The holy place actually represents your new born again. The porch represents your willpower, and the inner court actually represents your soul. The outer court represents your body. Now, I, I'm not going to be able to do that justice. You can study this for many months. I know Lee touched on it many weeks ago, many, many months ago. You can, you can study this for months. I just want to focus on the holy place, which in terms of a new context of demon is your heart. Just a side note, everything in yellow and gold there, that is turned within your spirit and your heart. Everything outside of that is actually turned into flesh. It's your soul and the inner court, which is your thoughts and your imaginations and your emotions. You'll see there's quite a dark brown block around between the, the holy place and your soul. That's actually called the, the hidden chambers. I won't go into too much details around that, but those are the hidden places, not within your conscious of your soul. So what does this all mean? What are we going to explore today? If you go to the next picture on the slide, that is the holy place. I don't know if you can see it too well there, but there are things in this holy place that are of significance to who we are. The first thing I'm going to talk about in here is the box on the left. You might not see it too clearly, but that is the table of showbread. Right? 
The table of showbread, in terms of the din, had to have 12 loaves on it. It had furnishings and cutlery, gold plated cups, plates, and the table was in itself gold. This was a, meant to be a diner that was fit for royalty. But I think there's also significance in what that actually means. The 12 loaves are significant. Yes, talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. But it also talks about the 12 disciples that Jesus would do. It's essentially talking about community. If you go to the next slide. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? There's such, such an aspect of the furnishings of the holy place and of your heart that is rooted in communion. Communion not only with God, but communion with one another. each other. How powerful is that? That a significant portion of a heart's fulfillment within you lies in being around the table in community. Now, start to show you a little bit of a story. I grew up in a very much Anglican, Eucharistic type of upbringing, very religious, didn't really know Jesus at all. I came to know Christ not through emotion or anything else, but very technically. Uh, studying chemical engineering and towards the end of my student years here at UCT, I found 14 hours of seminars on creation science. Who would think, right? Watched it. And on May 11, 2018, on my bed watching that, gave my heart to Jesus. Adam and Eve were real, Noah's flood was real, the evidence we see in the world today is real, it talks to the biblical truth of it, and I needed Jesus. And I gave my heart to that. And in my zeal, for the next two years, lost all my friends. Because <laughs> they needed to come to know Jesus too. But I wasn't part of any community. I wasn't in church at all. In fact, I was looking for church, but I was more interested in winning arguments and proving my friends wrong that they needed Jesus. Because that's what happened to me. In 2010, I, I was really working for about two years, born again for about two years, and I got an opportunity to move to do it. Case of it. And moved to the south coast of Durban. You know, growing up in Cape Town my whole life. Um, culture shock. I did not know South African Indians. I did not know. No one tells you that when you get on the flight to Cape Town, right? I love it. They also, right? I love it. But I did not know culture shock number one, right? But I started working as a job as a TV, the shift hours, loving Jesus. But it was the last time. I still didn't really find a route to the community church, didn't know what that was. And the one day, I think it was in the first two weeks that I made my little bachelor flat, got on my knees and I prayed to God. He said, God, I need community. My heart was yearning out for it. The furnishing of my heart was not yet satisfied. I So I pray, and within a week, I'm in the gym, so that's what I kind of did. I worked shift, I went to gym instead. That's kind of what my routine cycle was for those two weeks. And I went to gym. And the one day, I'm trying to keep the story as short as possible, but I was spinning alone in a spinning class, and this guy came in, kind of big shots right over there. And he comes in, and uh, he was frustrated. He was like, the gym was packed. He didn't want to go in there. Now he has to spin with his dude in the dark and spinning room. I didn't know it at the time he was born again. He was going to a life giving church in the community. And God spoke to me and he said, Glenn, that's his name. He said, Tell this guy about my church. He's like, no. This, he told me this. He was, he was like, he's not doing it. He's frustrated. He just wants to spin and get out of here. So God killed his iPad and his, his iPod, whatever he was listening to. He said, Tell this guy about my church. Now he has to go in a spinning room. Try and strike up a conversation with some random dude. That was me. <laughs> but he was obedient, he was faithful, and he did. And he said, Hey, how long were you spinning for? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was 
<laughs> anyway, we had the conversation. It was awesome. And he said he really liked to come back in the light church. And funny enough, God was very strange in that, that I couldn't go to church that Sunday because I was peaking. It was like, amen. Two services a day, let's do it. But God sent me back to Cape Town. I had to go watch a soccer World Cup. This was in 2010. I had to go back, watch a soccer World Cup match, came back. So I didn't end up going to church. I ended up going to this small group. We called it Black Groups. And that's when the bottom of our heart just went, this is what it's about. We were able to sit down, laugh, talk about the word, share jokes and joy. Something I never experienced. But my heart just felt the first tomorrow, the table of show me. We were feasting on the word. We were enjoying each other. More importantly enough, it became a vehicle of discipleship. God needs that in your life. You need that in your heart. Not just to be disciple, but to disciple. There will always be something missing if you don't have that. We loved it so much so that obviously I got stuck in everything. We can go out for houses to where things went really bad. But then I ended up meeting my beautiful wife. She was my wife at the time, I was thinking, but we got married within a year, we had three beautiful kids, and in doing life together, we loved small groups so much that we actually had two. We had one on a Wednesday, we had young adults, and they would come, and they would stay up till one in the morning. And then we, later on, when we started having a family, we actually uh, had two. We had a family connect on a Friday. So we had two aspects of doing life together, and our hearts were just full. It's aspects of community that your heart can cycle and you need it. As the table will show me, your heart needs that fulfillment and desire. The next aspect of the furnishing of a holy place. So by the way, we, we, we have just started our uh, small group here in the Anyone else look for a small group? Um, we, are, we have good space. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's just the summary. It's about our communion with God, our communion with the body of Christ, and aspects of the sign. You can go to the next slide. The next thing, you can't really see it too clearly. It's a little bit of an altar just before the veil of the holiest of holies. That's called the altar of incense. Now, incense is mentioned quite a few times in the Bible. It's more or less often indicated with prayer. In fact, if you go to the scripture, Revelation 8, 4, it says the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angels. Let me tell you this now, church. Your heart needs prayer. We can't live a life and expect our heart to be established without prayer being a critical part of who you are. And there's no right or wrong prayers. You may pray this sometimes, not getting prayer the will of God, or those kind of things, you can't be praying for things that are clearly in opposition to His word, please know that, that's why the third furnishing is quite important. But know that whenever you pray, it arrives from the throne of God. Sweet. That's the purpose of it. It's almost some supernatural way that God allows our prayer to traverse to the throne of God and be sweet to His presence. It's not speaking about some perfection that God's looking for in the prayers that we do. Even in our dire moments, God still hears our prayer. In our happiest moments, He hears it. It is still sweet. The next scripture, I think I got it up there. Let my prayer be set before you as it is. And is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. I grew up in an Anglican church where you just had to repeat. To say it after them. And our, our, our relationship with God was through the priest. It was through the prayers that they did. It was through the communion that they established. And those people still love Jesus. So they have the capacity to come to love Jesus. And they can still do good things. But what is the condition of their heart? God wants the fullness of your heart to come forth 
where you're not relying on someone else to pray, but you are boldly standing before the altar of incense, declaring to God. Foster a life of prayer, just as you would communion with fellow believers around the table. Foster a life of prayer that it becomes a cornerstone to your holy place or heart. The, uh, the next one. This thing is huge when I saw it the first time. This is not a little lamp that you would see just either in the corner somewhere. This thing is massive. It's huge. It's more than me. It has seven lamps. You can see them. It's called the menorah. It's got seven lamps, seven lights. It's fully gold. And it's very much centralized to the, the holy place of your heart. Now we know that in Revelation 4, we are moved to what the lights are. If you go to the next picture. It says here, in Psalm 119, 105, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. That scripture became very pivotal to my life. When I moved to Durban, we got stuck into a small group in Connecticut. And something just clicked. At first, I thought it was about winning people through arguments and winning the argument losing the person. That, was, that didn't work out too well. But once I got stuck in and sat on his feet and heard his word, everything changed. I messed up royally growing up as a kid. <laughs> Some of you may have heard the testimony around lust becoming quite evident in my life from a young age. I uh, just grew up self serving. all about me, right? But when I came to Life Church, there's a church in Durban, the Word of God just unlocked. Something in my heart that drove me to want to be honorable and pleasing to a son. I was there in church for about two months and I met Jackie and I liked what we were doing. And we just connected the whole day. We just talked the whole day. And part of what I just shared with you is that the next woman that I'm going to get is going to be my wife. Fortunately, that actually came true. Mm -hmm. Yes, we kissed for the first time on a wedding day because I chose God's standing way. I got us and us and it was a grace for them. And we had to put in strong values and become a significant amount of effort. Second to that, we obviously got to get very early on um, within a few months. Plus, probably within six months we were engaged and we were married by the end of the year. But we chose to do Bible school together. We chose to sit at his feet, hear his word, and go through the whole Bible. We did two years of Bible college. Just love the word of God on a Sunday. We had two services a day, we'd be there. Two services a day. Get it twice. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> the word of God just became so pivotal to leading our path, directing our path, where we should go, where we should do it. And you would see the Bible just had highlight marks for everything. It's like, this is amazing. This is what it needs to be. It sets up an establishment in your holy place in your heart. For the last two years. The second thing on that, that's the light. You got the Revelation 4 verse 5? Yeah, it's that one. In front of the throne, the seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. How beautiful is this picture that we have a lamp and lights that represent both the Word and the Spirit within our mind. You can't have one of the other. If you have a fire burning, without a lamp, the whole temple's coming down. You can have the zeal of the Spirit, and if you're not tempted by the Word of God, you can go off into some very strange spiritual retreat. 
same thing is like that. You can have the lamp and the fire, you're in complete darkness. Just so you know, that is the only source of light in the temple. If this thing went out, that priest is knocking over the table of showbread. Alright? It is pitch dark because that is darkness. You need both. You need the map. And you need the map stand. But was this fire supernaturally burning within the temple? Anyone know? Do you think it was supernaturally burning? Kind of glory? No, it wasn't. In fact, the priest had to come in twice daily to fill up the lamp with oil. How significant is that? That there's also some work and effort that takes place, right? Yeah. And we can talk about that in the New Testament context, we'll get there. But this is not some method of earning some sort of effort to get God to do something. But there is some aspects of something we need to do in response to this grace and mercy that God has just given us in the midst of us. That was the only light in the room. If you go to the next scripture, I want to make sure I'm tracking correctly. Here we go. This is Romans 1 21. Paul's writing to the Holy Spirit for quite a large, extensive thing to write why the world is in the condition that it's in 2,000 years ago. And Paul writes, They did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. But he came futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were dark. Has that dark and taken quite a significant sense when you start, start looking at the holy place? If we know that the holy place represents our heart as the temple of God, when that becomes dark, something's missing. Either the lamp of the fire, either the word of the spirit. That needs to take place and root somewhere in your heart. The third thing that could be missing is the oil. Now, God is so amazing in His Word. He shares it. I didn't put this scripture up there, but it's in Matthew 25. I'm just going to paraphrase. Do you guys know what Matthew 25 talks about? There were ten virgins. Five were wise. What were the other five? Foolish, foolish parts of God. And what did they neglect to do? Oh, they did not have enough oil in their hands. And when the bride grew cold, panic ensued that they were not going to cut it. But I think God is so gracious and merciful. This is not a physical world, you're not going to go by this far, right? Spiritual context, right? I can't get you the oil, guys. You're not going to buy it. Right? If you're one of the five virgins, you can't buy the oil. But what was wrong with the five of these virgins? They weren't watchful. They weren't attentive. They weren't ready. They weren't expected. There's got to be something within our holy place of our heart to be expected to God to illuminate something within us. So often the light of the world can approach into that, right? And it can make us care about things that are quite insignificant. And all throughout scripture we see this, but this scripture is so pivotal because those two things that the Holy Spirit writes, it says, they did not glorify him as God. The word glorify, it's not kind of just praising him, it's not exalting him, it's not shouting his name. It actually means just an evaluate. So when you glorify God above all things, you value Him above all things. That's it. When it comes to your workplace, or your marriage, or the things you do in private, when it comes to the way you view the world, is God above everything else? That is the value. Because now it comes to everything, Lord, I have to actually put everything at your feet. When we got married, Jackie and I, we, uh, she felt a strong call to start a school. And 
This was literally, we got married in December 2011. In 2012, she gave up a year. She was teaching at the time, studying at the time, completed her Bachelor of Education for Foundational Phase, and she was to start in primary school, pre primary school. So she took the first year of our marriage, she started the school. She was pretty much laying the foundation. 2013 came, four kids. Beautiful, that's definitely two of which were free because they were past his children. <laughs> Do you know what? We knew God was having this on her heart, and on her heart, because she still needed me. Not getting a salary for good, she wouldn't have survived had we not committed that together as, as a husband and wife. And we had a plan of, you know, we'll wait two, three years and then we'll have kids, you know, enjoy the first few uh, years of. Got a lot of hands on that. Within a few months, he said that he was pregnant. My firstborn was on their way. Never stopped anything. We started the school. It was beautiful. And we poured our life into this. Everything we did was centered around doing what God had called us to do. Now, for me, Jack is busy building school. After 10 years, we had 80 beautiful. We had, you know, beautiful classes, beautiful grounds, all built on the church land, and it was absolutely beautiful. We felt like this is God's calling our life is now heading towards completion. At that point, I felt this from the Lord. God was really speaking to me a lot about teaching, not just the word, because after doing two years of Bible school, the then supernatural school ministry started coming on and being lay leadership of the church, being on eldership, and also teaching at the Bible school. So, working full time, teaching about the culture. And eventually, God led me to a point of laying everything down and going on full time. And again, I gave up a year, no salary, volunteer. This was around 2016, 2017. To come on to staff and expand the school from pre primary to primary school. Not only that, but also being involved in church. Being involved in the, should I say, the absolute nature of organizing church. And life was great. We felt strongly pulled by God to be planted there, grow there, buy a house, buy some land, plant to God, flourish, and your kids grow up. We love them. God, I hope, has interesting plans, <laughs> which we kind of figure out along the way. And we were involved at that time, literally come at the end of the volunteer year. And things just started to go a little bit wild for the kingdom of God. Like at that point, the, our senior eldership had decided that we were going to merge three churches together. Beautiful, prophetic words, excellent. We were like, we're on the board. But it had some serious significance spiritually. And things beyond our control, beyond our, should I say, knowledge, us being blind spotted in that moment. For the next year or two, it was quite apparent that there were divisions. Right? Things do happen. Divide divisions can occur. God wants you to mend that as best possible. Be at peace for men. This was in our immediate relational facility. The closest relationships we have had within Durban. And it was fractured, unfortunately. Not going to go into that. But what we didn't expect. That that division would take root in our marriage. And it was almost two sides of the faction. And we're like, we woke up one day and we went, something is wrong. We gave it to God. We came here and we glorified God about our circumstance. And we were thankful for what we had. And in doing so, we didn't know what we needed to do. And God gave us a prophetic dream. Very detailed one. My wife has the dreams, I have an interpretation. Right? Tag team. Okay? But we submitted that dream as well to many other people we trust, and it was literally laying everything down. The school we built, we bought lots of time and everything to. But it was never ours, we didn't put it in our name. We had served Jack and Water, God raised the priest. And when we submitted our hearts to this, we said, God, your will 
fact, then it will go. What? <laughs> and this is now in the middle of lockdown. This is 2020 now. COVID's ending, it's lockdown, level five, you go to activities, they don't go. So we committed to our hearts to saying, guys, we are no longer going to be part of building in this while our marriage is the last. We need restoration. But we also could be built together with something that had been divided. And we committed then by the end of the year, both of us would have ever resigned from the school and operations for the church. God was leading us to move to Cape Town. Obviously, the plan worked, right? Because we are here. <laughs> but we had no idea. We knew that in January 2021, we were jobless and homeless. And we had no idea how long it would work. No idea. So in March, we made a decision. We are stepping out of faith. This is what we're doing. We told our family. They said, we're not. We said, somebody said, we told you so. They said, we're not. But we did. And by January 2021, we were living in our home that we found and we didn't pay for. And I received a job that I didn't say my CEO. And God had a plan way greater than I could ever have imagined. It showed that I worked every effort to try and get a job and to find out absolutely, but then I know it was going to be there. No, I had to step out of faith and say, Lord, I know this is what you're wanting us to do. We're going to glorify you, but everything else, even though our hearts are saying, this is fear and anxiety. I've got three kids now. Fortunately, I didn't have to school. My wife's a teacher, she can go to school. We're like, tick. We've got that sort of thing at least. You know, we don't have to do that. Thank you, Jesus. I can't tell it's expensive, guys. Wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Coming from case of it, I was like, ah, oh, things are really expensive. We submitted all that to him. But illuminated my heart, and we filled that land with worth, glorifying Him, and we excessively, supremely thank that God is who He says He is. If you have any notebooks here from cell phones, I'd recommend you read 1 Thessalonians 5 and Matthew 25. We're going to tie some things in around this. But at the end of the day, what I was saying, and I think there's a last picture there. Oh wait, go back. That one, just go back. One bit slowly, it's 518. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. That word quench, in the Greek, it actually means extinguish. Bring forth all of gladness and thanksgiving. Always. Whether it's a tough situation or whether it's the glory situation. It's so easy that when things are going really well, we can be like, oh. <coughs> and when things are going bad, it's like, we don't want to give thanks for that. Because then we feel like we're giving thanks for pain or sickness or disease. But the will of God is not to thank God for all that. But it's to give thanks in the midst of all that. Everything to thanks. For this will of God in Christ Jesus. For you. The last picture I'm going to share, and this is ready to go. This isn't on your on your screens, there's no QR code for this. But you can see that the temple of God is not meant to keep the life inside of its soul. It flows from the spirit through the heart, through the doorway, the porch. And into your soul, into your thoughts, into your emotions, into your body. It's the inward flow going out. You cannot be that way around. If it is, you're only in the dark of the light of God, the power of God, and the Spirit of God from illuminating your soul and seeing beautiful changes within your soul, within your body.
just this morning it's about to finish his law. The table of showbread, being our communion with one another and with God, the altar of incense being our praise that we would give to God for those around us. <coughs> and finally, the Lord, the word, the lamp, and the spirit, and the light, and our thanksgiving and the Do you know what's even more powerful than all that? So Jesus was hanging on the cross, and he gave up his life. And in that death, the payment was rendered. What happened in the temple? They had a big curtain that separated the holiest of holies. The very presence of God was born into it. Now it's not this effort of human hands within the holy place, but the Spirit of God, the very tangible presence of God that dwells in you, in your heart. Shatanic glory illuminates far greater than what the Lord can do. How beautiful is that? That this is, isn't an effort of human hands, but God who dwells within us to allow our souls and our body to be illuminated so we live and through Him by His Word and Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Remember that our sermon audio and videos are also available on Shofar TV. Go to www.shofaronline.tv to download and share.